Good day everybody, today's tutorial I'll be showing to you how to make fantasy weapons and magic with the help of 3D primitive materials in Clip Studio Paint. I am a 2D illustrator but I also have a little bit experience in 3D so that made me wonder if we could use some 3D features here in Clip Studio Paint to model a weapon. The answer is yes and no, since Clip Studio Paint isn't entirely a 3D application but we could do some tricks to form something with the use of basic primitive shapes. After all, learning drawing starts from a simple shapes, right? So the first thing I have to do is to create a sketch of the weapons, plan ahead and figure out what could be the shape of it. You can make it simpler as long as you can read the detail of the sketch. During the moment I've been sketching this, I'm trying to make a shape that is a little complex so that I could show you how to solve some problem you may encounter. Alright, now I'm done with my sketch, it's time for me to get the primitive 3D objects and hide the sketch for now. In my case, I've modified my HUD into something I'm comfortable with, and I could just get the primitive material on this edge whenever I need it. If you can't find yours, or if ever you lost it for some reason, just go to the window in the menu bar and open up the material, and choose Material Primitive. This will show you all the primitive material, the plane, the cube, the sphere, and the other else more. We could do something a lot more if we're going to be creative on mixing these shapes. But first let me walk you through what are the things we need to modify these shapes. So, drag the primitive object that you need to the canvas, and you'll be creating a new layer once you do that. Note that this would not be your layer for your 3D objects. We'll cover about that later. Once you have the object, you'll be seeing these blue icons on its top left corner. These are the tools you'll be using most of the time. These are the camera controls and navigation tools. And when you click the object, you'll be seeing this large thing here. We call it Gizmo. Gizmo allows you to scale, move, rotate, and resize your object. And its color identifies as XYZ axis. Each color specifies the direction when manipulating the object. Let's talk about what we need under the tool property of the object. This may look intimidating, but we're not going to use everything. But if you cannot find these, you could still go to the window in menu bar and click the tool property. But in this tutorial, I'll be going to walk you through under sub-tool detail. We might find something we need here. Well, this turns out to be more and more intimidating, but trust me, I'll explain it the simplest logic way as much as possible. Well, as you can see, there are gray boxes here where you can hide and unhide what you want to see under the tool property. You can modify yours to have quicker workflow in the future. Under the operation, I may only need a few but important things here. The on-screen manipulator. This is the gizmo. If you wish to hide some of it, you can unhighlight one of these. But for me, I'm just gonna leave it unhide. Pivot point for multiple objects is also a very important feature here. At this point, I want you to select the midpoint of multiple objects. Pivot point is this gray orb in the middle of the gizmo. The reason behind these settings, if you have a lot of object on your canvas and wish to rotate everything all at once, by default, the object rotates referring to its local pivot point, which is something we might not want. So then if you choose midpoint of multiple objects, you could rotate all of them as if they are one. Now that's all the very important things I want you to do under the operation tool. The rest you can just experiment and test what are the things you might need. Now let's move on to the object list. This acts as a layer of your 3D objects, not the one we used to have in painting. Under allocate, there are still object list and some settings you can manipulate your 3d objects but i usually do the navigation here on canvas since i find it easier now under the camera tool you can navigate the camera through here but i usually don't though the perspective is one important thing since you can set the focal point here by number if you know about wide lenses this is the settings for it now then we jump to primitive 
under the general primitive, you can change the number of divisions to your 3D object. For the cube, it didn't really do much, but in the prism, it would turn into a cylinder if you increase the division on x-axis. This division lines is called wireframe, and you can hide it by unchecking the show wireframe. Under the primitive texture, you can change the color of the 3D object or add texture to it, but we'll get to that later. Just want to let you know that texturing will be part of our tutorial. Then there is also a texture settings that you might need. And then under the shadows is where you can hide the light source and the cast shadows. Now under the light source, you can control the direction of light if you wish to change it. I'm just gonna leave it checked because we might want it. Now for the rest of the settings, I'm just gonna leave it as it is. And now we are ready to model our 3D objects. Drop the cube, rescale it until we get the shape of the text box. Then you can duplicate the object to create the front cover. Align it to the text box with the help of snapping. The magnet icon is the snap tool and you can turn it on and off if you wish. This is very useful because we could tell that the object was actually snapping at the center of the other object. So if it happens that you're very meticulous, this is a huge help. For us to make it easier to identify which is which, you can change its color temporarily. Proceed on copying the object and resize it accordingly. Then keep on doing it until you get the basic form of the item. In this case, the book. Then I lessened the division, since it doesn't really matter anyway, to our cube primitive, but kept some of it because I might need some accurate measurements. Then I added a sphere at the center of the book. Since I don't want to see the divisions of the object, I could just hide the wireframe. Now this should be enough for the shape of the book. We could still go further from here, like add more primitives to make it more and more detail. But we have to keep it this way since there's something we should do to this later on. Now we're done on the book, we should now proceed on making the sickle. We should still be doing the same thing. But in this case, we'll be using the prism object. To turn the prism into a cylinder, you'll need to increase the division at least up to 50 to make it look smoother. And then under the object list, we can rename each object so that it will be less confusing. You'll notice that I'm only been using the plane or a polygon to the blade. There is no available shape for the blade, but for now, let's just gonna use this for later. For the staff, we still be doing the entire thing the same way. The only thing I'll be showing you at this point is you could copy the multiple object at once, then duplicate it, rotate it to 180 degree and reposition it to the other side as if it is mirrored. If you remember the pivot point for multiple objects, this is the time you could use it. Here let's say you duplicate all the objects that you need and rotate it to have it on each corner of the circle to get the exact shape of the staff I've drawn. And this became so useful on detailing the staff. Now I'm done modeling it at least as close as I could, it's now time to proceed on making the necessary textures. All you need to do is to paint the necessary textures that is good enough to show the design including the colors, though it doesn't need to be perfect. And you'll be only painting one side. In my case, I'll be painting the front cover, and no need for the back since I won't be showing it. Then the blade of the sickle and its tiny design at the tip of the handle and save the painting as a PNG file with a transparent background. To your 3D object where you wish to add your texture, you have to export its map under primitive and save it to a folder where you prefer. You'll be given this UV map of your object. Those lines you're seeing was the divisions or wireframe. This means you could apply texture to your object now. If you aren't sure about the orientation of the map, you can simply make trial texture by numbering it 1 to 6. 
then save it as a PNG, then import it to your 3D object. But since this is Clip Studio Paint, you can just save it as a Clip Studio file. Now you know the orientation of it, you can now simply replace it with the one we made and stretch it accordingly. This UV map serves as a guide so you know which area you're already in within the 3D object. The reason why we need it to be a PNG file so that we can use the transparency of the image. That means if we import the sickle blade with a transparent background to the plane, it will form into the shape of the sickle, including its shadow. You'll notice here I changed the polygon to plane because apparently the blade I drawn didn't fit to the wrap. If we're going to apply this to our staff, we can make a hole on the center of it and showing a little bit of thickness. Now the rest of the object will simply be a color we wanted and hide its warframe. You can turn off the light source if you wish to color pick to the colors on the other objects. Now before I proceed to finalize everything, I added more to my 3D object. Added more texture to it by playing around on noise and ripples under filter. Make it look as close as I intended it to be by adding more primitive objects on top. Then to finalize everything, let's arrange them according to our liking but be sure to match the perspective of each item under camera. If you think the shadow is too dark, you can increase the ambient light intensity under light source. You can even add colors to the lights if you wish the shadow to be more stylized. Also, adding a secondary backlighting will make it better. I turn off the cast shadow under shadows since I won't be needing it. And when if you're satisfied with the result, you can finally convert the layer into raster layer. The last thing you gotta do is overpainting the whole thing to get an accurate look for your fantasy props. We are now finished to our illustration. So, what we learned here is, we could use primitive 3D objects even with the non-color one and serve the entire shape as our guide for drawing weapons. But having it textured, giving you less thing to draw on to finish. That means saves more time and finish more projects. That's all for this tutorial, hope this helps, and thanks for watching.